My name is John Hawley, the County uh, Ag Educator here in Dearborn, um, and uh, really happy you're joining us. Um, this is the first session of our webinar series. This is the uh, third series we've done now, and um, we've had continued and, and growing interest in this, and so we want to thank you for making the time. And, and if you're watching the recording, thank you for um, uh, for doing that as well. Um, we're really happy to, to uh, have our YouTube channel up and running. Um, we have uh, a list of many, many videos that I think would be of interest to you, so please make sure you check out our YouTube channel channel. We'd love to have you um, uh, checking out those resources. But today is all about pest control. Um, and when we were deciding topics for this program, um, you know, I was thinking through not only what I hear from my clients and, and uh, as extension educators, myself, Kyle, and my colleague Tom on the call as well, we get a lot of different questions, whether it's, uh, you know, what's going on with my tree? What's, what's eating up my cabbage? Um, and why do I keep getting these flies in my pantry? And we're going to talk about uh, subject matter that hits all of those questions. Um, and that's, that's the role that Extension has played for Indiana residents for well over 100 years now, is, is answering those tough topics or addressing those tough topics with research-based education like we will do today. So um, this is very informal. I'm going to be asking for participation um, just because we know how Zoom is. It can be very static. I don't want to just be talking to this PowerPoint. I want to be hearing from y'all um, because pest control at this time of year is, is actually very, uh, very critical um, because we're heading into the winter months. A lot of the creepy crawlies that we have uh, in our homes or around our homes, they find their way into our closets and into our kitchens because they're looking for warmth. And uh, we've had some slightly unseasonably cool, right about normal, maybe I should say, temperatures lately. So you've been seeing more creepy crawlies in the home. I know you have. So let's, uh, let's get to talking about the home uh, to kick things off. And um, when we talk about pest control in the home, um, you know, it, it, it can vary. Uh, the picture I've got here, just the, just the basic stock photo I have, that's probably a 3,000 foot uh, newer home. Um, I deal with clients that are living in 200 year old homes here in Aurora, Indiana. Um, you can definitely guarantee the pest control management techniques for house one versus house two in that scenario are different. The way we built homes 200 years ago is night and day different than the way we built homes now doesn't mean we can't safely uh, inhabit those homes, but the way that we manage for insects and weather and, and, and how we insulate and, and things of that nature uh, is much different than the, than the building methods of today. Um, and, and when we look at how homes are constructed today, um, pest control is taken into account. Uh, you know, a lot of new homes are, are built with things such as gutter guards that prevent buildup of, of moisture and, and, and mildew and, and debris that, that encourages insects to get in the house. They're built with better windows than they were. Um, they're built with better ceiling and, and uh, brick and, and concrete than we had um, back in the day. So um, as we get to talking about the home, keep that in mind that not every home is the same. The challenges that you face may be different than the challenges that your neighbor on the other side of town faces. So like I said, I want to have an interactive session. You don't have to turn your mic on. You can put something in the chat. Um, you can raise your hand, whatever works for you. But the question I want to ask today is, is uh, how are you currently controlling or managing household pests? And this isn't just insects. If you've got mice problems, anything else. So um, the, the, the floor is open. How, how are the listeners here today controlling or managing household pests? Don't be shy, please. Okay, well, perhaps maybe while some folks, there we go. Thank you, Tom, to kick us off there. That's okay. I, I certainly understand the Zoom shyness. So perimeter spraying for bugs, that's, that's the first thing that, that Tom brought up. Probably the most common method when we talk about using chemical, and we'll talk about non-chemical options as well today or non-chemical management, um, you know, perimeter spraying for bugs is, is very common. Um, I see Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. We had raccoon issues last fall and winter wound up getting help with trapping. Um, bingo, that, that is a, a, uh, you know, a direct response to a living um, mammal problem. We get a lot of that trapping, you know, controlling of, of the smaller mammals that, that find their way in. Oh, y'all are doing great. Thank you. Thank you. I should have given you more time. Y'all are just rolling in with the responses. Um, uh, Crow Shore is saying trapping, manual removal, and pesticides. Perfect. Um, Catherine is saying uh, closing up entry points and pesticides. Thank you, Catherine. That's another good um, uh, contribution there. And then glue traps. 
Thank you, Cindy. Yeah, and, I, and Cindy, I, I, I did see that you had your hand raised. Um, did you have anything you wanted to say or just, just in the chat? Okay, anytime today, you know, you can unmute your mic. That's not a problem, but I do appreciate the chat as well. So um, that's not a problem, Cindy. Um, the, you know, the glue traps are something we, we, we will talk about today. And, you know, we'll, let's just get right into it with the, you know, with the glue traps. So when we talk about those sort of methods, be, be mindful that's not an end all. Um, traps are a complementary method for pest control in the home. You will not, especially with insects, you will not fully control insect problems in your home um, with glue traps. Um, but what I do tell clients and folks I meet with, glue traps are a great way, especially in basements, to tell what might be hanging around in there. If, if, if you're not in your basement too frequently, perhaps you're not quite sure what maybe is, is um, and insects do leave fecal matter. So, you know, what's, what's pooping in the corner or perhaps what, what these dead, um, you know, creepy crawlies are, um, setting a glue trap in, in high traffic areas. So against baseboards, behind cupboards, behind um, storage facilities, things like that. It's a really good idea um, or a really good method for keeping track of, okay, what kind of spiders am I seeing? Perhaps what kind of roaches or mealbugs or other, other things that we're seeing in the home. So um, we'll talk more about glue traps, but I, I just couldn't resist um, adding some commentary there. Um, so let's talk about the actual household pest before we get into management. And I really do appreciate the interactive uh, nature so far we've had. Typical household pests. Some of these are actually generally beneficial insects, um, especially in, in garden settings or in farm settings. But within the home, don't, don't, you're not going to get any judgment from me. I am not a fan of spiders in the home. 99.9% um, .9 of spiders you find in your home will be harmless. Many of them don't even have um, the ability to break human skin. However, spiders are spiders. I respect it. Um, a lot of folks, you know, they'll stomp them. They'll slap them. They'll, they'll spray for them. Oftentimes, you, you got a designated cup or you'll use something else, a small little you know, maybe a small box to get them out of the house and you release them outside. That's fine too. Um, but spiders, uh, as we'll talk about when we get to the garden section, are a benefit in the garden. But in the home, even though they'll eat, they'll, they'll eat plenty of other bugs, um, a lot of folks, especially if they're somewhere within like a bedroom or perhaps the kitchen, they're, they're, they're going to get rid of them. Uh, centipedes, millipedes, very common in this area, pretty much throughout the United States. You'll find different species of centipedes and millipedes that love to find their way in. Another insect that generally won't bite but can um, and, and does provide somewhat of a beneficial uh, function in, in garden settings. Roaches, um, they have their role in the environment, but uh, in the home, they're generally uh, associated with unsanitary conditions and such. Um, def many different species uh, of, of, of roaches and generally with roach problems, we see some sort of connection to um, food waste or some sort of connection to um, just very wide open entry points and, and, and things of that nature, maybe pet food laying out. Um, so keep that in mind uh, that roaches are certainly a, a uh, indicator of potential problems with cleaning up. We'll talk more about sanitation here in a bit. Um, I, I do, uh, I, I, I am going to cover moths to an, a, a, an extent because I've been getting more questions about moths. So we'll, we, we, we will get to moths. As you can see in the picture, that is a brown marmorated stink bug. I would bet that every single person listening has seen these in their home. Um, and we'll talk uh, even more about the stink bugs as well. Um, once again, for a long, long time, County Extension has helped folks out with bed bugs and, and mice problems, probably uh, two of the more commonly thought of pests within the home. Uh, bugs, uh, you know, bed bugs are often associated with, um, you know, a, a, a I don't want to say poor living conditions per se, but you know, uh, you know, older furniture and 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 things of that nature. I can tell you right now, I've had clients um, from the you know all walks of life that have brought bed bugs into the office in sealed containers, thankfully um, for identification. And so, uh, you know, very common. Anyone can get bed bugs. You, you you know, we've had movie theaters with bed bug problems. You've had hospitals with bed bug problems. Um, and then mice, uh, you know, mice are incredibly common around here, especially the, uh, the white footed mouse um, or, or mice that you'll see. Um, very, uh, very sneaky, can, can, can move through entryways, kind of like cats that are very, very small, sometimes as small as a dime. Um, and if they, if they can sense or smell a food source, they will go toward it. 
And then lastly, I, I'm sure Kyle and Tom, too, get a lot of calls about birds and bats finding their way into the homes. We had somebody mention a, a raccoon. You know, I, I'd probably rather find a raccoon than a, than a bird or a bat in my home. Um, uh, mostly on, on the bird and bat side, my, my, my wife is absolutely terrified of anything that flies. Um, I actually had a pet bird growing up for a few years. I'm not really scared of birds, but, um, you know, as far as the birds and bats go, uh, just very difficult to get rid of in certain scenarios. And um, I've had many calls, especially about bats. Um, so I said I wanted to focus on pantry moths. So um, let me know in the chat if you've seen these bugs in your home. There's many different species. Um, they, they, they look just like this. Th this picture on the screen is actually what's known as an Indian meal moth. Um, these insects are generally going to feed on um, your typical like, uh, you know, grain products. So your flour, your rices, your cereals, pancake mix. And if those things aren't properly sealed or in airtight containers, they will proliferate within your homes. They are very, um, they have one purpose once they reach this maturity, you know, of, of adulthood, they're going to breathe. They're not even going to eat. Most of these species of, of uh, pantry moss don't even eat anything. Um, it's only the larvae. Um, and Cindy, thank you, Cindy, for sharing. Yep, you've seen them in the home. Um, one reason I wanted to dedicate at least one topic today to the pantry moss is because I'm still fighting them in my home. Um, we figured out it was the dog food. Um, we had sealed it pretty well. In fact, it was within a, a storage um, uh, bench within a plastic container, but Sometimes bugs find a way they get determined. We kind of put it off. Next thing we knew, we kept seeing two or three of these a day in our kitchen. Um, so we threw out some other things we found. And um, generally, you know, they're, they're not really toxic from any of the research I did before, uh, you know, before finding my own problem and also before preparing this presentation. Um, but they're just an absolute nuisance. Um, and like I said, they, they are prolific breeders. Um, they uh, tend to uh, lay their eggs in very... Um, you know, uh, hidden spots. Um, so anywhere where there's a food source, they will lay their eggs. So the, uh, the adults will find their way out um, from where they hatch um, and they will generally lay their eggs on a, a food source for um, the larvae to eat as they emerge. So we're talking, you know, like uh, imagine an old box of Cheerios sitting in the back of the pantry, um, that sort of thing. Even unpopped popcorn uh, can be a target for these pantry moths. And we'll talk more about control of these sort of insects um, later on. All right, here's public enemy number one when it comes to household pests in Southeast Indiana. Um, I'm not sure I get any more calls than I do about brown marmorated stink bugs when it comes to pest control. Um, these are an, a highly invasive insect um, and they're also an agricultural nuisance, I should add. That's not on my slide here. Um, and, and they've been in our area, I think, for roughly a decade plus. Maybe Kyle and Tom have more commentary on that later. Um, I've only lived in this area for about five years now. But um, they are an absolute menace. Um, now, there, there are other stink bugs that, that are native. Generally, stink bugs are considered a garden or agricultural pest in, in, in all regards. However, um, you know, native insects play a role, invasive insects don't. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, these bugs not being from here, or originally from Asia, they have no natural predators. And so they're able to breed almost out of control with no, um, you know, ecological method to, to, to you know, uh, combat them. Um, and these things have been established so long that in the southern part of the country, we actually have an invasive orb weaver spider that's been reported throughout areas of like Georgia. And um, even though that's an invasive spider, they're actually wondering if it's a benefit because that's one of the few things also from Asia that will eat these stink bugs. But in our area, there just isn't a whole lot that will eat them. Um, as far as control and, and, and identification, like I said, there are native stink bugs, so it's important to note that these things have some unique features. My next slide will have some really close-up pictures of this, uh, this menacing uh, pest, um, but uh, you know, keep in mind that uh, if you see uh, you know, this guy, um, even just one of them, it, it, you know, keep an eye out. Um, You've probably heard your extension educator or other, um, you know, professionals tell you that the best method for truly, um, you know, controlling these things is just to physically remove them, put them in a in a a cup of water and soap or a bucket of water and soap, and toss them outside. Um, physically crushing them 
as their name implies, releases a smell. Um, I've made the mistake of vacuuming these things. And um, I'll be honest, you know, knock on wood, the smell doesn't really hasn't bothered me too much at times. I'm not vacuuming up hundreds of these things, but I've talked to other folks that absolutely, um, that absolutely just, you know, almost want to vomit when they smell these things, releasing the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the smell that they do. And, and yeah, Tom's adding, you know, when, when you crush these things, they stink. Um, and, and they'll, you know, that, that, just if you get any guts on your hands or, you know, if, if we do have cases where dogs and, and such will eat these or cats will eat these and um, just just an absolute messy bug. Um, and I can almost guarantee that everyone on the call today has seen these. Um, and we'll talk about how to control for them better. Um, but I wanted to make sure I had a a nice up close picture. Um, very, very uh, typical uh, appearance for a, a stink bug. Um, if I changed the color and did some Photoshop on this picture and changed everything to green, you would probably recognize that instantly. Um, and so, uh, you know, with the brown marmorated stink bug, a few individual or unique characteristics that we see um, that smooth the shoulder around the top of uh, the, if you want to say torso of the insect, they have white bands on their antenna. And uh, they've also got alternating black and white bands on, on, the, on the back side of their body. Um, to be honest, anything that appears visually similar to this is going to be 99% a, a brown marmorated stink bug. Um, perhaps the closest in appearance um, would be the brown stink bug. But, you know, if you see 20 of these, in, like I do in my sunroom every few weeks, um, it's, it's the brown marmorated stink bug. So be mindful of control. Um, I, uh, I've got a, a two-year-old at home and uh, we, we did have a case where she found one of these and she ate it. <laughs> so that'll be one story to tell. I remember my parents uh, growing up always told me that I ate a cricket when I was her age. So um, her, her story is the stink bug. Um, and and to, to uh, assure my wife of, of her health and safety, did some double checking that there is no really you know, any reports of toxicity with these things. But for those in the call that may have kids, grandkids, dogs, cats, um, you know, if they eat them, haven't seen too many reported problems, maybe uh, some upset stomachs. But, uh, you know, uh, with, with, with the bug populations this high, you may run into that problem. I ate a stink bug or my kid ate a stink bug. What do I do? Um, and yeah, Sharon, uh, you know, up close, they're honestly, uh, you know, in their native environment of Asia, beautiful insects, uh, nice coloration. Um, they serve a purpose there. But uh, in the modern world, we have in problems with invasives. And, and I really wish they weren't here in southeast Indiana. If there are any questions throughout the program, just make sure to stop me. Sometimes I get um, on a roll and, and I want to make sure I check the chat as frequently as possible. Okay, so I, I, I've talked a lot about specific uh, problems we have in this area as far as individual insects and pests. Um, now I want to give you some solutions or some, some advice for how to move forward. Um, and, and, and I wanted to make sure that, that I touched on probably the most um, important concept when it comes to pest control within the home, and that's regular maintenance. Um, you know, if, if we aren't sealing windows properly, if we aren't, um, you know, uh, perhaps, um, you know, fixing cracks and in, in doors and such, and, and, and inviting these pests in, if we're not cleaning up enough, um, you know, all that falls underneath home maintenance, then the pest control you know, issue isn't even relevant. Um, and so these, these go hand in hand, regular home maintenance and pest control. They are, they are one in the same in many regards. Um, and, and really uh, not, not, not only your extension educators, but, but other, other professionals will tell you this. And it may seem like a broken record. You know, I've got bugs in the home. What do I do? Well, yes, we'll get to pesticides. We'll get to traps. That's fine. But you got to figure out where they came from in the first place. Um, and sometimes we do have cases where bugs have existed in the home so long that they just continue to breed. They continue to find food sources. So we've got to find, start focusing on those factors. But, but when it comes specifically to home maintenance, be sure that you're sealing windowsills. Um, chimney flues can be a really big problem for inviting insects and other pests, especially smaller, medium-sized mammals in. We get reports of that all the time. Um, leaking fixtures. Uh, I'll tell you right now, water equals pest problems. We, we see it all the time, or it equals problems with mold and mildews and just unhealthy home environments. 
um, and then securing entryways. Um, and and you know, as per, as I was preparing for this presentation, I wanted to make sure I was I was looking myself in the mirror and being honest with myself because there's probably 20 home projects I could do, um, and I do understand uh, the 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 constraints of time and and everyone else is busy with things. I I I, I get it. Um, you know, but if you run into certain insect problems, uh, you know, 99 times out of 100, you can link it back to, well, we should probably seal the windows better, or we should probably, um, you know, be cleaning this up or sanitizing a bit better. Um, and that gets into my next point here. Um, as we start talking specifically about what actions to take beyond the home maintenance topic of, of uh, insect control within the home, um, sanitation's uh, a, a big starting point. And you may think, you know, specifically um, to disinfecting or Cloroxing or bleaching, that's that's important too to an extent. But with insect and mammal pests, um, the term sanitation, where we're kind of focusing more on just cleaning up, um, we're focusing more on you know any food containers. Perhaps uh, you know uh, you you like to do a lot of barbecuing or grilling, or uh, maybe you do a lot of cookouts or you do a lot of eating on the deck. And um, you know sometimes we get tired and we're like, ah, I don't want to clean it up tomorrow. I'll, I'll I'll you know leave those leftovers sitting outside. You know maybe a bird or a bug will get them. Um, or perhaps uh, we've got, um, you know, kids uh, like myself running around with uh, containers full of Cheerios and they're dropping those in the corner and they're getting swept underneath the chairs and the, and the furniture. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a guarantee that, you know, those food products on the floor or uh, perhaps hiding behind the fridge um, are, are going to invite pests in, but it's, it's a higher likelihood than not. Um, you know, we, we, we all know the old cliche of, you know, you spill a, maybe you spill a bottle of Coca-Cola and it goes underneath the fridge and, oh no, we're going to have ants. Well, <laughs> I can tell you right now in our area, especially during the warm season, if, if you spill something and you don't clean it up properly and it's got a sugary content to it, you'll, you're, you're inviting those sugar ants, um, as, as, as we call them in this area, um, and then trash, you know, it can be really easy to uh, get behind. Maybe you're on vacation, you fill up the trash container, you forget about it, you leave for a week or two and you come back and there's, you know, flies and things of that nature. Um, you know, we all know about the later summer, early fall when we do a, a barbecue outside and those those yellow jackets just just fly around the garbage cans because they're they're looking for that end of the season food source um, as they get toward the end of their of their cycles, their their uh, other life cycles. Um, but, uh, you know, can't can't mention that stuff enough. Um, cleaning up after kids and pets and, and taking trash away in a timely manner. Um, and, and, and then a lot of times, you know, we talk about debris around the home. Um, you know, maybe you've done some home improvement projects or some landscaping and that debris is just sitting on the backside of the home, out of sight, out of mind. But really, it's inviting pests and, and uh, maybe you've got water sources. Standing water in the middle of the summer is going to instantly invite insects and flies and other water-based, um, you know, uh, pests like that. So just, you know, I, a lot of that sounds like a broken record. It's like, John, you know, my, my mom told me how to clean up. Don't tell me that. Well, just a, a good reminder when we think about pest control that it's not all just let's go get the can of ortho and spray something. Um, there are, are always reasons why, um, especially if the insect problems are, are, are long term. You know, why do I keep seeing these flies in the home? Well, we should have sealed the dog food better and kept an eye out. We should have done something sooner. Um, so just keep that in mind as we uh, get into the more traditional thoughts of pest control. So, you know, your typical household uh, pest control methods um, are not always necessary for all the reasons I've already mentioned. If, if, if you employ those cleaning and sanitation and, and maintenance methods uh, with, with uh, precision, um, you may never um, or, or you, you, you may virtually never need, uh, you know, traps and sprays and such. Um, and within the home environment, you know, we're going to talk about gardens at the end of the presentation, but be mindful that within the home environment, um, using insecticides, you know, presents an additional risk. Um, I talk a lot with clients that have had bed bugs or flea problems. I know growing up in, in Southeast Texas, uh, and we had indoor outdoor cats, indoor outdoor dogs. I can't tell you how many times we had fleas in the house and we fogged, we'd say, let's put the fogger up and go to the store, or put the fogger up and go to a baseball game. You know, and unfortunately, as you search through 
the poison control records and and news reports there have been just horrible cases of people losing pets and even in some rare cases you know children and people being in a home when these insecticides are 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 used and if those foggers are used and you're within that home there there can be some acute toxicity problems that send you to the hospital um so be very mindful use caution um with any products whether they're conventional or even if they're labeled organic um you know be very mindful of that um as, as far as, um, you know, household cleaning products go, um, according to, you know, EPA rules and, and, and regulations, uh, you know, bleach is a pesticide. Anything that's, that's, that's killing a living organism, you know, we spray bleach to kill bacteria, to kill uh, viruses. Um, that is a pesticide. And so there are rules and regulations and, and proper labeling. Um, and if you don't follow those to a T and, and something happens, especially if, um, you know, perhaps you're in a commercial setting, you know, forget the house, you know, if you're in a commercial setting and you improperly use those sort of products and someone were to be poisoned or exposed, uh, you could be liable. Um, and so within the home, it's more just about taking care of your family and your own health. Um, and I don't want to scare anyone, you know, these products, if used properly um, in the scenarios that they're needed in, are, are very safe, um, but uh, just keep that in mind. So when we think about uh, your typical methods, you know, your traps or your baits, I mentioned this earlier, you know, your sticky traps. There's a picture right there on the screen. Um, the, these are not a, a, an, an, an end-all solution. They're not a silver bullet, but properly using sticky traps, among other methods, will help you assess what insects you may have in the home. A lot of the insects, uh, we, we know the typical cliche with you turn the lights out, and flick them back on and all the roaches go running. You know, um, a lot of insects are light sensitive. And so if you set traps in dark areas and, and they, they walk over them in the middle of the night, you'll know what insect problems you have um, and you can better control, better make management decisions for you and your family within the home. And then uh, Tom mentioned it earlier, residual insecticides like ortho with, with chemicals like bifenthrin, um, very safe, very well tested um, and can be very effective. You know you, you, you know, you see the ads, you know, spray the perimeter of your home for 18 months protection. Um, you know, doing that properly can, 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 yes, certainly provide a barrier for those outside insects getting in. And then I already mentioned the fogging products, you know, use, use caution uh, when it comes to, uh, to those. So perfect. I think we're doing good on timing. Any, any more questions before we talk about um, pest control in the garden? All right. And like I said, feel free anytime uh, just to drop a question in the question uh, or the chat box or, um, you know, just just let us know uh, if, if you have any thoughts to add. All right. And once again, uh, I'll, I'll give you more time uh, this this time. But but what methods are you currently using in the garden to manage pests? And I'll give you some time to put that in the chat. I think as folks are typing away, you know, one thing that, um, you know, I've, I've really made a, a big concerted effort for in my garden is, is just cleaning up the debris at the end of the year. Um, and, and that's really a, a fairly uh, effective method. Um, you know, uh, a lot of our insect problems can be overwintered on debris. And so when I'm done with the garden, I rip it all up and I either dump it on the other side of my property or put it in a, in a bag and, and, and throw it away. Um, and, and not, not every, you know, be careful to check with your municipalities because some do not accept uh, that sort of refuse in your garbage containers. Um, but um, really good responses coming in now. So let's start with Tom. Um, he uses exclusion with row covers. That's that's very good. Um, Sharon, she sprayed her zucchini leaves with a vinegar water solution a few times. So an organic method. Thank you for sharing, Sharon. Um, Catherine, watching for Japanese beetles and drowning them in a cup. Good, good. Another nasty invasive insect we deal with. Um, uh, Crashore, uh, sprays, manual removal, tilling the soil. Thank you. Um, ro uh, rotating crops, some seven dust is needed on the marigolds, et cetera. Good, thank you, Cindy. So yeah, definitely several uh, methods mentioned there for pest control um, within the garden environment. Um, and, and, uh, really, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, talk about several different methods, but, but first let's go ahead and just kind of introduce some of our common garden pests that we see in Southeast Indiana. Um, thank you, Tom. I, I, sounds like my video might be slowing down. Let me go ahead and 
we have had some slower internet from time to time here. I'm going to stop my video. Okay. Appreciate the heads up, Tom. If anyone can't hear me, just uh, shoot me a message here. Thank you for that. So common garden pests, uh, in, in our area, we deal with a lot of, uh, you know, your, your typical moth larvae um, uh, insects. So your, your, you know, your hornworms, rootworms, cutworms. Um, these are also common agricultural pests. So our, our farmers deal with these on a pretty, a pretty regular basis. Um, if anyone on the call produces tomatoes and doesn't see hornworms at one point or another, uh, let me know your secret. Because I tell you right now, they are out there. You will see them. And sometimes they can be so quick and deceiving that they will strip your tomato plants within a matter of hours. Um, aphids are another very common insect, another major agricultural pest um, that are also a major contributing factor to disease problems in the garden um, because of the residue that they leave um, as they feed on various garden plants. Um, we've talked a lot about stink bugs already, um, and they are a uh, menace in the garden as well as in the home, both the invasive brown marmorated stink bug as well as our native stink bugs we deal with. Um, and, and primarily with the stink bugs, as well as the aphids. Now, aphids are a much smaller insect, different family, different, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, feeding structure per se, but they both use uh, mouth parts, uh, piercing mouth parts. So a lot of stink bug damage will, um, will be pretty indicative of a, of a piercing mouth part. Um, beetles, a lot of beetle problems. So, you know, there was a picture of a cucumber beetle on the last slide. Um, we deal with uh, the Japanese beetle, um, which is the, uh, in, in the soil is known as a white grub. Um, and that does not mean we need to kill our native grubs. A lot of people see Japanese beetles, they think kill grubs. So they go by spectricide um, or another product that treats soil. Um, and generally that is not recommended. Um, but Japanese beetles, um, I did not see quite as many this year, I will say around my home, but I do know um, of, of many, many, many people that uh, talk with me on a regular basis about Japanese beetle problems. Um, and then we talked a lot about insects today, and, and that's, that's important. You know, we, we, we should be focused on insects, but, you know, the uh, four-legged and, and, and mammal pests are another problem. So rabbits and deer and squirrels. Um, my colleague Tom mentioned exclusion earlier, and so when it comes to the, the um, you know, term exclusion with insects, we're talking physical barriers like plastic or perhaps netting. Um, small, fine mesh netting, I should say, like we did with the cicadas. Um, but with larger animals like a rabbit or deer, exclusion may equal fencing. Exclusion may equal electric wire. So um, those are things to keep in mind um, when we think about the mammal pest versus insect pests in the garden. And yeah, Catherine, thanks for sharing. Uh, she said that she had raccoons destroy their guard or their corn plants this year. Um, you know, like I said, I've lived out here for about five years now, and and I, I'm a big fan of, of corn. I, I one of my first internships was helping a crop consultant um, evaluate the uh, the uh, health of corn um, in uh, my home state of Texas. And I'll tell you, I've always wanted to grow corn, but never have. And, and for a lot of the reasons that you're mentioning, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk to our sweet corn farmers in this area and, uh, you know, they'll lose up to 20, 30 percent of their crop in extreme years, not only to raccoons, but to, uh, you know, deer and other feeding mammals. Um, and uh, <laughs> Cindy, thank you for sharing. There is no exclusion method for squirrels and crows. And uh, to an extent, you are, you are correct. It can take a lot of efforts to grow, especially those, those highly sought after crops like corn. Um, you know, it can be tough to keep squirrels, crows, raccoons, um, and, and even deer, if they're hungry enough, um, out of uh, your corn field. So most of the people in our area that, that have any sort of success with their own sweet corn, they're generally planting a lot of it, and they're accounting for feeding the deer squirrels and raccoons, uh, unfortunately. Um, but but as, as we get to other garden, um, you know, plants um, as well, you know, we need to think about signs and symptoms. Um, and in the agricultural world, this is a, a, a big topic. You know, uh, when we teach farmers about integrated pest management, which we'll talk about here in a minute, I, I, always, I always love to teach home gardeners about IEM or integrated pest management. It's a, a, a core part of the Master Gardener program. It's also a core part of my own personal teaching curriculum when it comes to garden education. Um, but, but signs and symptoms are, are two separate things that help us in the path of identifying pest problems. So symptoms are visible 
subtle changes in plant health. Um, so when you think about wilting or discoloration, that's going to be a symptom of a garden pest, perhaps. Um, or diseases. We, we could talk about diseases too, but we're, we're, we're focused on pest management today, which is generally more the, uh, the creepy crawlies and the uh, mammals. Um, and then signs, a, a, a visible and direct evidence of a pest. So that's going to be egg masses, like you can see in the photo there. That's going to be frass. So that's the insect fecal matter uh, that gets left behind by many species of insects. Um, tracks or bite marks left within on plants. And then um, I mentioned earlier with aphids, um, they produce a sticky substance called honeydew. And a lot of you might know about that um, on various garden plants. And that honeydew um, is, is a big attractant um, for diseases uh, because it's just kind of, it's sticky in nature and um, it, it uh, can, can grow all sorts of disease and, 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 and other problems from it. Um, and so you'll, you'll often see aphid problems complicated with disease problems going hand in hand. Um, and Cindy did add one more thing in the chat I just saw. Uh, she mentioned that her fruit trees also get ravaged. And yeah, just like the corn, it's very difficult to grow fruit in the home in this area, um, more, more so for disease problems. Um, if you can get past the disease problems and then and the spraying, spraying chemical, uh, organic or not, um, you know, then you have to deal with the pests. You know, you get that big apple, you're almost ready, or you get that nice juicy pear, and then, uh, yeah, the uh, raccoons and every other animals come in and clean you out before you can harvest, and it's just really, um, really unfortunate. So when we talk about identifying garden pests, there's a lot on this slide. I'll try not to talk through all of it. Um, you know, it, it, it's, really a, it, it's really an important thing. Misidentifying a garden insect, perhaps instead of thinking you have a, a, a bad insect, you truly have a good one, and you decide to apply seven and you cover your garden. Well, seven is going to kill your beneficial insects too. Um, now, there are times where using seven and, and, and getting to that point is necessary, but if you don't properly identify what is or isn't feeding um, on your garden plants, uh, then you can make that sort of decision and, and, and others and detrimentally, uh, you know, harm your garden. Um, you know, a, a few general tips for identifying insects. Um, be, be sure to closely examine all the physical parts. You know, um, if you're able to get up close to the insects, uh, as I've got on the slide there, do not handle an unknown insect with a bare hand. Um, that's going to be uh, a big no-no. Uh, eight, nine out of 10 insects in the garden are not gonna be of any sort of physical harm. Um, even some of the beneficial insects uh, may not appreciate being picked up. Um, you know, if you are, Maybe working with a friend or a fellow gardener to identify an insect. Maybe you're about to give me, Kyle, Tom a call. Um, be mindful of the unique characteristics. You know, what, what's the size of the insect you have? What colors does it have on it? Um, does it have antennas? Does it have wings? Um, and, and then go to your trusted, reliable sources. Uh, the iNaturalist app is my favorite. Um, it's not necessarily research-based per se. It does link to a lot of research-based um, information, um, but it's a social network and community of people that are sharing pictures of plants, animals, bugs, et cetera. There's also online forums like Ask an Entomologist where real scientists are actually helping folks out. It's uh, more of a recent discovery of mine. Um, and, and then lastly, uh, if there's, especially if you're maybe uh, got a large garden and you really don't want to lose uh, the majority of your plants or you're just very, very curious, uh, Purdue does have a campus testing lab for an $11 fee plus shipping. We will positively identify any pest or disease problem you have. Um, and I really uh, love working with my colleagues there at the, uh, uh, at the lab. So a few tips, I wanted to make sure I found a really nice graphic from my partners at Wisconsin Extension um, about identifying garden pests. So you can see two different kinds of insects, very similar in appearance. You've got the Eastern cone nose kissing bug, which is a rare, but, um, a, a, a rare bug, but a true vector of Chagas disease. Um, you've probably heard about the kissing bugs and their, their bite of death. Um, some people use that term, that's probably a little extreme, so I do apologize, but um, the uh, Chagas bug um, or the kissing bug does, does pass on that very severe Chagas disease. Um, you're, you're not going to find a lot of these out there, um, but when you look at a beneficial bug like the conifer seed bug, you may assume based on appearance of the abdomen and body length and the presence of antenna that, hey, I think I saw a cone nose kissing bug. Um, 
that is one you would not want to handle with bare hands. Um, even with gloves, I would encourage you to not touch any bug that has that appearance, even though they're very rare. Um, other physical characteristics. What's the length? Um, this, this diagram mentions color. It mentions um, the distinction of the hind legs. Um, it mentions, uh, you know, the presence of antenna. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, keep that in mind. This is an example from Wisconsin, um, but uh, there are many, many other um, similar insects that can be compared to bad insects and vice versa. Um, and, and so don't, don't make quick assumptions unless you absolutely know what you're seeing. Um, and as Tom mentioned, if you decide to ever submit anything to the diagnostic lab, um, you can actually attach photos before you submit a physical sample. Um, and you don't necessarily have to submit a physical sample. It's just the lab generally prefers that for a 100% um, a positive ID. I wanted to mention this. Um, now, integrated pest management is a farming agricultural term, true, true and true. But um, I have continued to share this term and this technique, or I, I really should just say this, this practice um, with, with my gardeners. Um, because I, 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 don't, uh, I don't want you to remove pesticides of any kind, organic or, or not, as a tool in your toolbox. Um, but they are not option number one and they never should be. So when you think of integrated pest management, that, that is a combination of cultural, mechanical, biological, and yes, chemical controls for the garden. So we, we use the pyramid of, you know, what's, what's the number one thing we should do to prevent insect problems around our gardens and landscapes? Number one, cultural controls. That includes mowing higher, properly watering, um, you know, What's your soil content? Are your soils, you know, healthy? Are they not? Um, choosing the right plants, uh, fertilizing carefully, um, that sort of thing. Um, are you cleaning up your debris in the garden at the end of the season? Those are your cultural controls, um, as well as kind of leaking over into point number two, which is mechanical or physical controls. Um, a lot of the insects we deal with in the garden, um, they will hop from weed to garden plants. So are you pulling weeds? Um, are you uh, cleaning up that yard debris, like I mentioned? Um, are you sharpening your mower blades? That's a mechanical and physical control method. And then going on to something that may be a little difficult um, for you to introduce per se, but um, I mentioned, or I will mention beneficial bugs. If you identify those bugs at all costs, protect them because they are helping you in the garden. Um, so parasitic wasps, uh, ladybugs, um, and then natural pathogens that, that will kill um, harmful insects. Um, that is a biological control. And in some cases, um, farmers will actually introduce those biological, biological controls themselves. And then the last resort, chemical controls, spraying a herbicide, spraying an insecticide, spraying a fungicide. So really loved this graphic from my partners at Illinois um, and wanted to share that today as far as pest management goes. So I mentioned those biological controls. Um, so you have beneficial garden helpers that are there to work with you alongside you in the garden um, at controlling negative um, you know, pests uh, within not, 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 not only you know, in the garden settings, but you know, I meet people that, hey, they see a spider in the basement like we talked about earlier, leave them alone, let, let, let the spider eat the bad bugs I don't want. Um, so in the garden, a spider is a very good sign. They're going to be eating your, you know, perhaps stink bugs. They're going to be eating uh, flies and, and other, um, you know, insect pests. Um, your, uh, we've got, I think, three different native species of mantis. So your praying mantis in Indiana, uh, they, they are champions of, of eating. They, they eat a lot of different bugs. Um, both beneficial and non, but um, generally the mantis are seen as a good thing in the garden. Um, now we do have an invasive Asian lady beetle, but the native ladybugs are very good. Um, wasps, wasps play a huge role. Um, many, many wasps will actually, um, so we think of soft bodied insects like larvae that eat up our, our cabbages and they eat up our tomatoes. Um, many wasps will actually harvest those um, and spiders do this as well. They'll actually harvest those soft body insects and they will actually lay their eggs within them. Um, and the larvae will feed on that living wasp or excuse me, that, that living larvae um, as a uh, food source when they initially hatch. Um, sometimes that involves um, wasps that will 
physically pick up that larvae, fly them into an underground hole and leave them there. Other times they will just deposit their eggs onto like the back of a hornworm and they will actually parasitize that hornworm and the actual, um, you know, living organism will be feeding on the hornworm until it can no longer sustain its own life. Um, so you'll see pictures of that. It's, it's a really neat uh, uh, process of nature. I mentioned centipedes earlier. And then the creepy crawlies that, yes, maybe we don't uh, want to see, but they generally are a benefit. Snakes, um, you know, you think your typical garden type snakes, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, you know, smaller. I'm not talking about, you know, rattlesnakes or copperheads, you know, those do provide a benefit in the environment too. But, you know, your smaller harmless garden snakes that are generally going to run away from you the minute they see you, um, you know, uh, and, and, very, very rare are you going to find a poisonous snake in this part of Indiana. Um, reports are actually very, very sparse for uh, poisonous snakes in this area. And so generally they're going to be eating, uh, you know, like your mice, uh, mice problems, uh, you know, higher populations of snakes, lower problems with mice. Um, but even, even then smaller snakes will eat bugs and, and uh, other uh, pests in the garden. Um, and then bats and birds. Bats are bats are king of feeding on insects in this area. And then birds can provide some benefit. Now we've talked about it earlier. Birds can all be a detriment for cleaning out our gardens um, toward the end of harvest. So um, some birds are a pure benefit. Others can be kind of more of a uh, of an in between. And yes, we can use pesticides when needed. So we've got the beneficial garden helpers, but as needed, um, pesticides are there for you. Um, and as the picture details, a person's wearing proper PPE or gloves. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, but this still should be a last resort. Um, you start seeing some holes in your cabbage. You start, um, you know, maybe seeing some uh, minor damage on your tomatoes. Uh, scout. And what I mean by scout is view, you know, visually look at all parts of your tomato plant, um, of your cabbage plants, search for those insects, see if you can find them, look for those physical signs, um, and, and then make a management decision based on how bad the damage is. Uh, most of our garden plants can sustain a significant amount of damage before we see a, an impact on yield or how many tomatoes, how many, you know, uh, heads of cabbage can we actually pick without it being just ruined? Um, and going back to those IPM principles, um, you know, properly, you know, following those uh, every year and year in um, is going to lessen the need for the chemical. Um, but don't take it off of your uh, tool belt. You know, don't don't take that option away from yourself. Um, you know, be ready um, if the need arises to use these products in certain situations. Um, and, and farmers, I'm giving you another ag term, but it's important for gardeners too. Determine that action threshold um, for for many um, for many uh, of us. The um, you know, the action thresholds can, uh, you know, be maybe 20 or 30% damage. Um, you know, in the farming world, it can vary, you know, with soybeans, it's going to vary, um, you know, uh, but usually when we may, let's say maybe 20 to 30% is, is your minimum. And what I mean by that is 20, 30% of your, um, you know, leaves are eaten away or, or, or chewed away, or maybe 20, 30% of your tomatoes that have set are, are getting damaged. Maybe that's when you go in and you start using that uh, chemical product. Um, and, and so determining those action thresholds for yourself, checking the research for one variety of garden plant to another um, is, is going to be critical for proper management. Um, I do see we got a couple of questions in the chat. I'll make sure I'll get to that. So um, I, I always, I, I'm big on pesticide safety. Um, these products um, that we use are, are, are there when needed. Um, but um, as far as, um, you know, using them, I, I want to be sure that you're safe. Um, so I, I have seen folks spraying any sort of product with shorts and flip-flops and it just, it just aggravates me to be honest, because that's, that's just not right. Um, if you read the label on these products, they're going to tell you almost every single product, no matter how safe or common or easy to find, will tell you closed toed shoes and gloves. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't want to see you in flip flops spraying anything. Um, I don't want to see you handling chemical with with bare hands. Um, you may not need goggles. Um, eye protection is a little more um, just depending on the product. Read that label closely as this uh, infographic uh 
know, shows you. Um, and I get it. We get up to 9,500 degrees in the summer. It's hot, it's humid. Um, but, uh, you know, be mindful that long sleeves may also be a really good idea um, or just, you know, gloves that go at least halfway up the forearm. Um, I know that sounds kind of nitpicky, uh, but I'm telling you, that's, that's the reason, um, you know, these products get pulled is people don't use them safely. Um, or it's one of the reasons products get pulled is people don't use them properly. Um, and then it just contributes to an overall negative. Well, these people aren't using them, we should ban them. Um, and I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, you had a resource for, you know, how to, how to prevent pesticide exposure. Um, and that's for organics too, folks. Uh, there are plenty of risks uh, with organic pesticides um, of any kind. Um, and so, uh, you know, invest in a good pair of, of gloves, um, chemical resistant gloves. There are a few different kinds out there. Um, and then uh, follow that label um, like it's, uh, uh, you know, like it's the law, because guess what? It is. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, 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 you know, be mindful. I get a lot of calls about how to, how to treat or uh, handle one particular bug or pest versus another. Um, according to EPA law, if you use a product that's not labeled uh, for what you're targeting, um, you're, you're technically in, in violation of the law. So I, I see a lot about, well, how should I poison this raccoon or, or such? And, and, you know, be, be mindful of the local rules and, and EPA rules and regulations. Um, you know, that, that's just a, 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 just a good general practice, I should say. So as far as, you know, common uh, garden pesticides, um, you know, it's not hard to find these things. Um, you know, you go to your local garden center, they're going to have different varieties, both organic and conventional. You go to big box stores like Lowe's um, and such, and, and you know, they're going to have a, a litany of products for you to go through. Um, they're generally inexpensive, and I think that's part of the factor why a lot of folks, when they get a garden issue, they go straight to the chemical because it's really for the homeowner, really not that expensive. You're, you know, you're buying maybe a $10, $15 bottle of concentrate you're mixing it with water, um, you're putting it in um, uh, a, a spray container, and then uh, you're, you know, you're using it. And these products, they stay shelf stable for a long time. Um, you know, they aren't going to necessarily spoil within a you know, especially if they're kept away from being frozen, they're put in a garage somewhere with generally good, uh, you know, uh, protection from the elements. And, and, and so it makes it a pretty inexpensive option. But as I've discussed, uh, hopefully uh, within, you know, a little less than an hour now, hopefully I've discussed enough of, of an option for you to not always go straight to the chemical products. Um, but they are there when needed. So let's talk about a few of them. For, for insect control, a few of you have mentioned seven today. Um, seven is a, a very common product uh, targeting, uh, it's, it's non-selective. So it's gonna kill most every um, insect it comes into contact to, or that comes into contact with it. Um, it comes in a powder form traditionally, but also liquid forms um, as well. Um, ortho, uh, that's just a brand. So they, they've got several different products for insect control. Um, the most common, I think Tom mentioned earlier, uh, has the chemical name bifenthrin. Um, that can also be used directly on certain garden plants and in certain situations. But bifenthrin is a product that um, our commercial applicators will spray around like schools. A lot of folks will spray around their home to keep bugs from getting in. Um, and then others, you know, your fungicides like Dacanil and Fertilome. Um, we'll talk here in a second about Roundup because I know it's a popular topic. Um, and then your pre-emergent products like Preen. Now those aren't gonna control for like bugs, but Preen and Roundup will control for weeds. And uh, as we know, weeds are also pests. So I mentioned Roundup. Uh, I know we're focused more on the creepy crawlies in the mammals today within and, and around the home, um, but, um, we've get a lot of questions about this in extension right now because it made the news. Um, Bayer, uh, which is the owner of Roundup, um, announced, I think maybe three or four months ago or so, um, that they will no longer sell Roundup in its current form. Um, and uh, I'm looking through the chat now and I appreciate the help, Tom. Uh, so uh, Roundup is actually the active ingredient in that product is called glyphosate. Um, it's a non-selective herbicide that will kill virtually any weed um, that hasn't built up a resistance to it, I should say. And uh, Roundup in its current form, according to Bayer, will no longer be available in 2023. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen the commercials about, um, you know, uh, have you been exposed to Roundup? Uh, there's a lawsuit, you know, you may be eligible for, you know, financial compensation uh, and, and, and so on. Um, Bayer was not ordered to pull the product from homeowners. Um, I think based on just the simple, 
cascade of lawsuits, they decided to, uh, to, uh, to move away from it. Um, I'm all about research-based science and facts. And what I can tell you, um, there are major agencies, including the EPA, um, uh, folks within the European Union that, that um, are still mentioning with proper use of this product, there are limited to no risks. Um, as, as I've told you today, wear gloves, use your PPE. Um, so, uh, you know, continue to use Roundup as needed. Um, what we know, like I said, from, from research and from legitimate sources is that it's still um, safe if used properly. Um, but there are organic options, and that's great. Um, extension educators are, are here to help you with any sort of um, pest management practice that you want to employ. That decision is up to you. Um, but just keep that in mind. I thought I would add it because it's such a popular question right now. Um, and, and just to clarify, you know, it's, it, this restriction or the uh, lack of availability that homeowners will see starting in a couple of years, um, that does not apply to farmers. So farmers will still be using Roundup um, after 2023 um, and, and, and moving forward, assuming they can find it. Um, there's some supply chain problems with Roundup I've seen. Um, but, uh, but wanted to make sure I add that. I know we've talked more about pests and such today, um, but uh, Roundup uh, and, and just that, that question about chemicals is uh, I think pretty darn relevant to this conversation and is a nice, uh, nice bow on the on the topic for today. Um, we're right at about an hour and um, I, I, I'm going to try to turn my video back on. If my screen starts buffering, let me know. Um, but I will answer um, any any additional questions that we might have. And feel free to throw those in the chat. Um, Kyle, are they able to unmute their mics? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. And no pressure. No, you know, if, if we're all good on questions, um, I, I, I do want to thank you for joining us. Um, this session has been recorded. And so this will be on our YouTube within a matter of a few weeks or so. Um, everyone that signed up today should have received an email from one of us. If you didn't, let us know. We'll get you on the list. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be sure that you get a link to where these videos are. Um, I tried to hit a lot of topics today. I think this topic we could do eight hours of. I'm not going to do that to anyone. Um, but I tried to hit on the high notes. Um, and so if you do have any additional questions, either contact me or if you're in a different county, contact your extension educator. Um, that's what we're here for. We're here to help. Alrighty. Well, thank you, John. We appreciate the information today. Uh, we certainly appreciate your expertise in the subject. Also, Tom, for monitoring the chat box and take care of the questions for us. So as you know, this is a uh, webinar series. So this was the first session in our series. Our next session will be November 18th. We will have Joe Richards from Ohio County. We'll be talking about forward quality. Uh, so that will be uh, uh, the next session. I think, John, we have something just popped up in the chat box. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kyle. And, and, and so, Cindy, you know, you're asking when to spray. Um, you might have been one of the ones earlier that mentioned you had fruit trees. You know, um, Purdue has some really neat resources for homeowners and, and, and fruit trees. Um, so when it comes to pest problems um, in, in that setting, uh, it can be pretty defined because you want to spray at certain times. Now, if you're asking about in the home or garden. Um, oh, thank you, Cindy. Uh, so with the vine borers, um, you know, exact timing. Um, after you asked that question, I, I did pull something up here. So I, I, I do know I've got farmers and gardeners that have actually used physical barriers as well. Um, but let's go back to what we talked about when it comes to um, thresholds. Um, so the vine borers are, are pretty darn notorious. Um, so I would say the minute you probably see them, it would not be a bad idea to spray um, because I, I do know many people that will lose their entire um crop or harvest, if you want to use that term, um, pretty darn soon, um, uh, the minute that they see the problem. And like you're mentioning, the covers do stop the pollination. So um, let me see if I can't drop this link in the chat for you. I'm, I'm going to drop uh, drop the video here. Um, I've referred to this one a couple different times when we've had some questions about the vine borer. Um, and our folks at Minnesota, um, there we go. Uh, have, have created this for us. This is what I'm kind of referring to. Let me make sure I send it to everyone. Um, those intervals for the, for the row covers are going to be pretty refined. So like you said, um, it, you know, the cucurbits are very, um, very, very pollination sensitive. And so, you know, you want to get that time just right. 
Um, and so when it comes to the spraying methods, um, I would say with divine borers, pretty darn soon after scouting and positively identifying those problems, um, it's probably time to consider that management decision. Hope I gave you a pretty good answer. I kind of rambled there for a second, but. I was going to just say, John, uh, if they captured that, I mean, it's when you're when you're saying scouting, that truly is the key and the important thing. I mean, you don't need yeah. to be out spraying willy nilly unless you just know you have a problem. So, you know, I just want to emphasize, like you just said, scout. And so to know when they're present, that's when you would start trying to do some control. But you did a super job, John. I sure appreciate it. Yeah. No, thank you, Tom. Yeah. And, and, and I, I feel like, you know, like I said, I've been in this area for about five or so years now. Um, the, the questions about the vine borer keep going up, I feel like. Um, I'm sure Kyle could say the same thing. I feel like I keep getting more. Um, and so I really like that Minnesota resource. The folks there do a really good job. I'm sure Purdue has a publication as well. Um, but uh, certainly, certainly a major issue around here. Okay. Well, thank you, John and Tom. We appreciate it. We're now our hour time limit so we do appreciate your attendance today and remember our next series will be november 18th so thank you very much for attending today